We certainly like to sing some of the great contemporary songs that are out there, but it's a joy to sing these hymns too, is it not? Oh man, they got such great words, hard to beat. June, yeah, you can already put that first slide up on the projector there. A little girl asked her mother a question. Mommy, how did the human race begin? Her mother asked, well, dear, God made Adam and Eve, and they had children, and so all of mankind was made. The little girl pondered her mother's answer. But the next day, the little girl asked her daddy the same question. Daddy, how did the human race begin? The father answered, it's like this, baby girl. Many years ago, there were monkeys who really loved to breed, and from them, the human race evolved. This confused the little girl as both parents answered the question in a different answer. So the next day, she returned to her mommy and said, Mommy, you said that the human beings were created from Adam and Eve, but Daddy said they evolved from monkeys. Her mother answered, Well, dear, it's really very simple. I told you about my side of the family, and your Daddy told you about his side of the family. (laughs) Okay. I think we have heard... Many times how influential mothers are, are they not on Mother's Day? Wasn't it Abraham Lincoln who said, all that I am or hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. By the way, uh, Abraham Lincoln's mother, Nancy Hank died, Hanks died when he was about nine years old. All that influence came for the, his first nine years. Oh boy, we got the psychedelic show going on again, okay? Okay. Um, I wonder if we want to try to turn that light off there, and I will get my light over here on the stand. Is it still going? If that light can be turned off, that would probably be great. A little, uh, the title of the English poet William Ross's, uh, Wallace's poem, The Hand That Rocks the Cradle is the Hand That Rules the World, has been a proverb to demonstrate the power of motherhood and how it can bring about sweeping changes across generations. A man by the name of Cardinal May Millard said, a mother is she who can take the place of all others, but whose place no one else can take. Someone has said, we don't know whom. Life doesn't come with a manual. It comes with a mother. Another said, if at first you don't succeed, try doing it the way your mom told you to do it at the beginning. (laughs) Barbara Kingsolver said, sometimes the strength of motherhood is greater than natural laws. Princess Diana said, a mother's arms are more comforting than anyone else's. Another unknown author said, nothing is really lost until your mom can't find it. (laughs) And here's another one, another unknown author. Sooner or later, we will quote our mothers. And one more from Phyllis Diller, a comedian of the past. I want my children to have all the things I couldn't afford. Then I want to move in with them. (laughs) Okay. The mother's quotes about motherhood are just plentiful. They're everywhere. But... You know, if you search through scriptures, it's kind of amazing. Uh, I was going to do a, a message that I would probably had done before, and as I was looking back, I said, boy, I sure have done a lot on Hannah and Mary, and Mother Mary. I can't do that again. And so I started going through the Bible, and I noticed that although there's not a whole lot of, there's a tremendous influence of women in the Bible, just like men, of course, godly women. I mean, uh, you know, a lot, of, but as far as, tracing what they did as mothers, that is not as easily seen in Scripture. But the Bible has a lot to say about mothers, though. And they're just not listed all in one place. There are different verses scattered out through Scripture. And so that is what I want to look at this morning. I want to look at Bible characteristics of a godly or of a good mother, even from Scripture. So let's ask that question. What makes a good mother, and then seek some answers from the scriptures. Well, the first one is, oh, how does this work again, June? I haven't done it for a while. Then I go down? Okay. A good mother is a joyful mother. A good mother is a joyful mother. Psalm 
113.9 says, He gives the barren womb woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. You know, there's a l- many examples in Scripture of women who could not have children. They were barren, the Bible says. But when they finally had a child, their joy just increased. You think about, first of all, Sarah. Remember? Sarah was a beautiful woman, apparently beautiful, even when she was uh, later on in life, 65 and above. But Sarah could not bear children. But when she did bear a child, and she, she even tried to go around the, another way to have a child. Remember, that was a tragedy as uh, she gave the advice of Abraham to have a child through her handmaiden, Hagar. But later on, that n- name uh, Isaac, okay, has to do with laughter. She was joyful when she finally gave birth to Isaac. Do you remember Rachel then? The mother, or excuse me, the wife of Jacob, she couldn't bear children, whereas her sister Leah could, and she was very jealous. And in Genesis 31, when Ra- it says this, when Rachel saw she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. <laughs> Jacob said, I can't give you children, but God did open up her womb. And Joseph was born, and Benjamin were bo- was born. And then how about the mother of Samson? She couldn't have children as well. And then the Lord Jesus himself, as the Bible says, that the angel of the Lord, but they, when they saw this angel of the Lord, they thought they were going to die. They understood this was probably God in the flesh. Then we have Hannah. Hannah, you remember how her husband loved her, Elkanah loved her, but Penina, the other wife of uh, Elkanah, she would just make life miserable for her. And even going down when they worshiped. And she just prayed. You remember when Eli saw her praying? She, he thought he, she was drunk. She said, don't cause me as a, as a worthless woman, an evil woman. I'm, I've got sorrow in my heart. And she mentioned that she's praying the Lord for a child. And the, Eli said, may the Lord hear your prayer and answer. And she gave birth. And she made a vow that if she had a son, she was going to give him to the Lord. So it was probably about age three. Can you imagine that? About age three, after the child had been weaned. They, uh, the reason I say age three is because when they went down and offered a sacrifice, they offered a three-year-old bull, okay? But so she gave little Samuel into the hands of Eli to work in the temple. And you know, Eli had already blown it with his own children, Hophni and Phinehas, remember? They were evil men. And they were put to death. But Samuel grew up to be a great prophet of the Lord, and the Lord was probably a father, more of a father to Samuel than Eli must have been. But anyway, and then there was, do you remember the Shunammite woman? When Elisha the prophet came to visit, the Shunammite woman made preparations, and, and with her husband, she made him a little place where he could, when going by there, they'd have a little place where he could stay and rest and, and, and such. And uh, he asked his servant Gehazi, or however you want to pronounce it, what can we give this woman in appreciation for giving us this place of lodging? And Gehazi said, she doesn't have any children. And so they prayed to the Lord, and the Shunammite woman had a boy. And you remember that boy, he was in the field working with his father, and he somehow got a fever or something, and he died. And she told one of her servants, said, we got to go to the man of God. And they harness a donkey, and she says, you drive as fast as you can. Don't worry about me. I'll be fine. Just keep on going. And when Elisha saw her coming, he told Gehazi, his servant, she's got a problem. Go and pray for this. It's probably with the boy. Go and pray and and make sure the boy is healed and safe. And when the Shunammite woman got there, she said, I'm not leaving you until you come with me. And you know what happened? Elisha did return with a Gehazi, tried to, to heal that boy, but he was dead. And it could not do anything. But when Elisha came, he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. And he warmed the flesh of that little boy and he came back to life. Uh, so there was the Shunabite woman. How about is, is, uh, Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist? She was also old in years and she hadn't had a child. But these women rejoiced when they could bear children. A joyful experience. You know, you can't always take everything for granted, though, can you? 
because you'd think that's a no-brainer when a woman has a child that just rejoice. But you know, see how it is in our society today, though? The statistics are, and it just grieves your heart when you think of this, ever since the Supreme Court passed that law that sort of overturned Roe versus Wade in that it was sent back to the states, remember, there has been a 15% increase in abortions, okay? Increase because of that. There are all kinds of women throughout the United States that want to have their reproductive rights. That's a freedom they have. And they want, if they somehow conceive and have a child, they want to have the privilege of ending the life of that child. They don't call it that, though. They call it an abortion, right? An aborted feces, as they call it. But it's a little child, as we even looked at last week in Psalm 139. So, you know, personal testimony. When I was a junior going to the University of Minnesota in Duluth, that was my hometown, my dad said one time, you be good to your mother. She's pregnant. And it went in one ear and out the other. <laughs> okay. You know, there was five of us siblings. My younger sister was 13 years old at the time. My older brother was uh, 22. I would have been 20. And one more time, he said it again. You be good to your mother. Something along that line. She's pregnant. I said, wait a second, wait a second. You said that mom was pregnant? <laughs> you know, I couldn't believe this, you know. My mom was to the point where she's complaining of aches and pains and all that. And us boys, you know, older... I mean, we, came, we made sure she got down the steps in Duluth, you know, in the icy conditions. Mom, take it easy now, you know. We're all looking after our mom, you know, because she's, she's pregnant. But I remember visiting her in St. Luke's Hospital after she gave birth to my brother Jeremy, who's 20 years younger than I am. She was like a spring chicken. She was so... I said, She's gone back 20 years in her age or something. She looks so young, and she was that smile on the face you couldn't wipe off her face. She loved it, giving birth to another boy, baby boy. A good mother is a joyful mother. Scripture indicates that. Okay, and then going on. I don't know how this works, June. Do I have to go? I'm going down. I'm sorry. I missed it, June. You can put it back up there. I, I hit the wrong thing. Okay, a good mother, Scripture says, can calm and quiet and comfort a child. Look at it again. A good mother can calm and quiet and comfort a child. You know, it says this in Isaiah chapter 66. The Lord says, as one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. That was a promise. But also, uh, the Lord says in, uh, or David, the psalmist said, through the Holy Spirit in Psalm 131, Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child in my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. You know, it is always amazing. To see, you know, there can be that crying baby, and nothing can comfort that crying baby. Baby, his mother comes along, and especially when they breastfeed, that baby is completely calm and quiet. A friend of mine used to call that rocket fuel because <laughs> it had a, a powerful effect on that little one. And you know, it, through the years as I've pastored in the nurseries that we have had in the churches I've been at, there have been women that have the ability to comfort little kids. Now, you can put men in the nursery, and they do a good job, but they don't seem to have the ability to comfort a little one like a, a woman has. I don't know if it's because the men don't have the patience or what, but a woman has the ability, a mother has the ability to calm and quiet and comfort a baby. Um, have you seen the pictures of the Jewish crowds lately in Israel? how they're just protesting. Their great goal is to have the hostages released. There are people who are greatly agitated, and the Lord is going to comfort them, it says, even as a mother comforts uh, its child, a nursing mother covers its child. Sometime in the future, David says, or excuse me, uh, Isaiah said, the Lord is going to comfort these children who are agitated, crying, so to speak, in Israel. Here's another characteristic of a 
a good mother, a godly mother. A good mother raises children with motherly laws. Okay, what are you talking about? Motherly laws. This is what the book of Proverbs says. My son, don't forget the uh, commands of your father. Listen to what he says. And do not forsake the law of your mother. Do not forsake the law of your mother. What kind of things are we talking about? The a mother's laws. These are the things that I remember my mom saying to us boys and to Janelle as we were growing up. On Saturday morning, we change the sheets on our bed. Also, you make your bed when you get up in the morning. You throw your dirty clothes down the laundry chute. You always say, please and thank you, right? Those are things mothers teach. When you eat, you finish what's on your plate, you clean your plate whatever we have. You don't swear or use dirty words or else your mouth is going to get washed out with soap. Here's one that my mom used to say to us, you take care of your younger brother. I mean, she made a real point of that. There are many other laws which she had and are too numerous to mention, but these are the type of motherly laws, which I'm sure you can relate to as you think back on your mother. We're going to give time for testimony a little later on. Listen to this. As I was looking through the scriptures, and I was looking through the word mother, chaining it all through the scriptures, and here's what I found out in the book of Kings and Second Chronicles. Now listen, I'd never seen this before. Second Kings chapter 22. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedida, the daughter of Adiah, a Bokrathkoth, and he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, in the sight of the Lord. Second Chronicles 25, 1 and 2. Messiah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Second Chronicles 26. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Second Chronicles 27. Jotham was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Hezekiah, 2 Chronicles 29, Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. That idea of the mother being interjected there is not for every king. It's only for those kings that did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. All the kings of the northern kingdom, as you know, they were all evil. And there were some cases when their mothers were recognized that they were particularly evil. The, the, the mothers were made known on that. Jezebel. Uh, uh, what's the other mother's name that was so? Athaliah, if that's how you pronounce it. Terrible mothers. Okay? Wicked mothers. Killed their, their children or their grandchildren. They were very wicked. Their, those names are mentioned. But for those kings who did good in the eyes of the lords, the mothers' names are mentioned. Isn't that incredible? What does that tell you? The hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world, right? Mothers are influential in producing godly men, leaders. Um, This past week, I read a little from the life of John Wesley. Why did I read it? Because I knew he had a very recognized godly mother. Have you heard of Susanna Wesley? It's a book by John Telford, a biography. Uh, she was the mother, of course, of John and Charles Wesley, whom we got so many hymns from Charles. Uh, there are some things I read, and I want to share these with you. I think you are going to say, wow, that's, that's interesting. Uh, a special, this is from Telford's book, a special providence seems to have presided over the marriage of the mother of John and Charles Wesley. She was both beautiful and accomplished, more than all else, She was a woman of rare judgment and sterling piety. Her mind was both clear and strong. Her husband's heart safely trusted in her during all the troubles of their long married life. 
and her gifted sons at Oxford, Charles and John among the two, felt that her advice on all subjects, both practical and speculative divinity, was of the greatest value. Mrs. Wesley's prudent counsels were also of conspicuous service at several crises in the evangelical revival. John Wesley said, Mom, write down what you did as mother. I want to record it down. Listen, Susanna Wesley was the 24th child of her parents, Mr. and Mrs. John White. 24th child. Okay? John Benjamin Wesley, that was his middle name. And by the way, John Wesley had two brothers by the name of John and Benjamin who died before he was born. And they gave him the name, the first name of those two boys that were died. John Benjamin Wesley was born 1703, was the 15th child of Reverend Samuel and Susanna Wesley's 19 children. Small little families back in those days, right? A good picture of John boy, Wesley's boyhood is gained from Susanna Wesley's account of the training of her children, written at his request, 1732. That training may be said to have begun, begun with the children's birth, even during the first three months of their life, which were mostly spent in sleep, they were dressed and undressed, and their clothes were changed at fixed times. Uh, at the, uh, after that period, they were, if possible, laid in the cradle, awake, and rocked to sleep. Repetition. They did everything exact. They rocked to sleep. The children were taught to fear the rod when they were only a year old. Can you imagine that? A year old, fear the rod. And by the way, I was going to mention this. I'll mention it when we get to that passage in Proverbs. A rod, you know, doesn't necessarily have to mean a big, long rod. It can just be a, the idea of the word is a branch from a tree, a, a twig, as it were, okay? But they learned to fear the rod, even as a one-year-old, uh, and to cry softly. They were taught to cry. You can cry, but you cry softly. Can you imagine that? By this means, the Epworth Parsonage, though full of children, was as quiet as if there had not been uh, uh, any in the house. Isn't that amazing? The children cried softly. As soon as possible, the little table and chairs were set near the family dinner table. These are all the laws of that mother, okay? Where they could be easily watched. The children were taught to ask softly for anything they wanted to eat, whatever was provided for the family. As soon as they could handle a knife and fork, they sat at the table with their parents. No eating or drinking between meals was allowed. Isn't that incredible? John Wesley, read his journal. He's in his 90s, and he says, I feel as strong as I did when I was a young man. He had developed some pretty good habits, and that's why you call it the Methodist church. It was a methodology of discipline, okay? Um, they, were pray, uh, they had to ask supper. Nothing was given uh, to them uh, before meals. Um, evening prayers were over at 6 o'clock. The children then had supper, and at 7 o'clock they prepared for bed. First the youngest was undressed and washed, and then the rest in turn. All were in bed by 8. Mrs. Wesley's first care was to teach her children obedience. First thing you want to teach your kids... Not the alphabet, not even their address. You teach them obedience. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that what Jesus says? If you love me, keep my commandments. That's how you learn to be a servant of the Lord. Learn how to obey your parents first. Then you will learn how to obey the Lord. Obedience. She knew that this was not only the way to rule well in a large household, but also to secure the happiness of her boys and girls. I insist, she says in an interesting letter, upon conquering the will of ch children betimes, because this is the only strong and rational foundation of a religious education, without which both precept and example will be ineffectual. But, then, but when uh, this is thoroughly done, then the, a child is capable of being governed by the reason and piety of its parents till its own understanding comes to maturity. And the principle of religion have taken root in the mind. One result of this training was seen in many times of illness. There was not difficulty in getting these model children to eat even the most unpleasant medicine. <laughs> Can you get that? 
Cod liver oil, here it comes. The little child takes it without whimpering, just takes it down. Religious training began as early as possible. Even before they could kneel or speak, they were taught to be quiet at family prayers and to ask a blessing by signs. I'm not sure what that was about. As soon as they could speak, they repeated the Lord's Prayer morning and evening. A prayer for their parents, some collects, catechism, scripture, were added as soon as they were able to learn them. No profane or rude words were ever heard in the parsonage. The children were taught to ask quietly for what they wanted. Crying never won anything in this home. Nancy, I may have mentioned this the other day, you know. The modern children are this. Uh, she was reading this to me. A modern parent says, if you stop crying, I'll, we'll go to the ice cream store. She's, Nancy said, how was it when you were growing up? I said, this is the way it was when I was growing up. If you don't stop crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about. <laughs> that's, that's the way when I was growing up. Okay, you don't cry, you know. So um, at any rate, for no reason at all, that is. Um, crying never won anything in this home. The code of honor observed among them allowed no promise to be broken, no gift reclaimed, no one attempted to take what belonged to his brother or sister. Confession of a fault always averted punishment. Confession of a fault. So that many temptations to falsehood were removed. You don't want a child to say, no, I didn't do it, knowing he's going to get a spanking, right? Confession averted punishment. Many other things could also be stated the way this mother Susanna raised her children, but the impact that she had upon ones like Charles and John Wesley made on this world is incalculable. How many Methodist churches are in the United States today because of John Wesley? Well, Charles too. In Wesleyan, you hear Wesleyan churches? There's just so many of them. In England and over here in the United States as well. Wow. She had her laws, and she taught these children, and they became godly men. Let's go on. So do not forsake the law of your mother. A good mother experienced grief and shame when she has disobedient children. That's what the proverb says. Here it is. <laughs> A child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Okay, you let a child go his ways. And what? A child has an old sin nature. Every child is born with it, like all of us have, right? So what do you think? Way it is in our society today. Mothers get back to work as soon as possible after they give birth to a child. You know, I know that sometimes it takes two incomes. I don't, I'm not going to judge them, but listen. The most important years in the child are those early years where parents today are sending him to nursery school to put him in the care of, a, of another who has, you know, these kids for eight hours a day, her child for eight hours a day while she's working. Listen, the mother is the one that has the greatest impact, the one who spends time with her, that child. Um, Proverbs 10.1 says here, this is part of it, a wise son makes a glad fa uh, father, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother. Proverbs 29, 15, the rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. And I said, a rod doesn't mean a big stick necessarily. I remember my folks used to leave us with our grandparents. I had a grandmother whom I credit as telling me about the Lord, and so I trusted in the Lord based on her testimony. But Grandma Cordes was about 4'11". She was so small, 4'11". But if we disobeyed, she said, okay, go cut me down a, a twig, a stick, a twig. Yeah, I don't know, man. Oh, okay. Go get that twig. And then she, you know, we had summertime a lot of time, and we had shorts on, and she'd lay that twig on our legs, and there'd be some stripes on the legs. But I tell you, you talk about effective those little twigs can really sting on the legs or whatever, you know. They didn't do any harm, though. Okay, but that's the idea. These verses tell us, let us know that a responsible mother who seeks to train the children to fear the Lord and do what is right and good, if they do not do that, they experience grief and shame 
of a, a child who is foolish and disobedient. You know, it seems today, though, that there are parents who support children who are selfish or bullies who commit crimes. I was, uh, after t- year 2000, I'd finished a pastoral position, and I had already been to Indonesia, and I taught in a high school, and I, it was a great time, an international school, mainly missionary kids. But I said, Nancy, it was such a good time. I would like to go and mix it up with some kids in school again. Well, we were in Michigan. I went all the way down to uh, Georgia and taught in a, a middle school in Georgia, seventh grade, life science. That was my undergraduate degree. And uh, I had kids that would look at me. They'd do wrong with a smile on their face. They Down there, I would say, more of a racial thing down there in Atlanta. It wasn't like that in Michigan, but that's the way it was down there. But I'd have one student, he was a smile. He warned me, he said, if, if I did the wrong thing, he was going to have his father's lawyer deal with me. <laughs> Pity the parent, father, or mother who supports a child who does wrong. That child will one day grow up to be a criminal. How many parents will take their child, uh, ch- the teacher treated them unfairly, and they'll bring that child in, into the principal's office, okay? And they want uh, correction. This is the way it was in our house, that if you got trouble at school, guess where you were also in trouble? You were in trouble at home, right? Now, my parents were just parents, but they could sense out if there was any deception that you were trying to pull over the wool over there, I could, they could sense it right away, right? And they pretty much figured out that for the most part, those teachers were, uh, wanted to do what was right for their kids in their class. Well, let's go on. A good mother, a godly mother, demonstrates, the last one, sacrificial love and care for her children. It's hard for you to read that. This comes from the book of Thessalonians, where the apostle Paul said these words to those Thessalonian believers. But we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day so that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Think about mothers, the sacrifice mothers made. How about Jochebed, the mother of Moses? Remember, he was a goodly child, and, and she hid him three months, but then she made that, wove that basket uh, for a little ark, and she put it on the river. And then, of course, the princess of Egypt came down there while Miriam watched, and Miriam got Moses' own mother to nurse that child because, of course, the prince of, princess of Egypt couldn't do it. But you think about what that mother of Moses taught that child in his first years, that he understood that the Jews were his people. Then you look at Hannah. Every year when they went up, after she left them in the temple, they're age three, every year she brought him the little coat, made a new coat for him. No doubt she prayed for him as well. The Shunammite woman, we talked about her, and we just read about what the apostle Paul said, that they were behaved like a, a nursing mother. Uh, that's how they, they, they just love those new believers. When I was in the airport one time waiting, I had apparently a buddy pass, and you never know when you've got an airplane. You can spend all day long nowadays on the airport with a buddy pass. But I went over to the bookstore, and I got the biography of Ben Carson, Dr. Ben Carson, the surgeon. And I read that book through when I was in the airport because I had plenty of hours. And that mother just amazed me. That mother had a husband that was a no-good husband. I mean, he had two families going on. It was pathetic. So she separated from him. From, and he didn't, she didn't have a great education. She had to work menial jobs, but she had to work from morning until night. But she cared about those two. Curtis was the older boy. Ben was the younger boy. And they were failing in school, and she prayed to God and said, Lord, please, show me how to raise these boys. I've got to work. I've got to make ends meet without really high-paying jobs. And the Lord seemed to direct her. Before they go out to play ball or do anything, they've got to go to the library, and she gave them projects to do. They had to have their homework done, but she gave them other projects that they had to do. I don't know where she got these projects. They had to find out... 
they became really close with the librarian at the library. <laughs> and they knew that librarian, the librarian would help them finish it before they could go out and play, okay? And pretty soon, because of all the time, they got their homework done for, and by, because of all the time they were spending in the library, when somebody came and they asked question, here's little stupid Ben Carson giving the answer to these questions. And the teacher was amazed. But Ben Carson knew the answer because he spent so much time in the library. He graduated valedictorian of his class in high school. Probably Curtis did too, the older brother, I don't know. Curtis is now an engineer. Ben Carson, you know, went on to an Ivy League, universe, uh, uh, Ivy League uh, university and he has separated babies in the womb of the mother, operated on children in the womb of the mother. Gifted Hands is a book that is now uh, recorded about Dr. Ben Carson, but they had a mother who taught them, and they became believers in the Lord as well. Today is Mother's Day. It's only right that we other mothers on this special day. We have women in, our, women in our society that have accomplished quite a bit, right? In the field of athletics, Caitlin Clark now just graduated. She's gotten all these kids looking to her sign autographs. We have women who have accomplished much in politics. We've got some great governors that are women, lawyers, judges on the Supreme Court, right? Singers, actresses, many different free, uh, fields. However, I think it holds true even according to the priorities established in Scripture, that the hand which rocks the cradle is the hand which rules the world. Although our culture often portrays a mother as someone who lacks ability to accomplish great things, and I hear one politician say, I don't go home and make cookies. That's not the thing I do. Huh. Looking down on those women who make cookies with their kids. Listen. A godly mother is the greatest coach, the greatest doctor, the greatest psychiatrist, the greatest teacher, chef, chef, counselor, ambassador than any other a mother is. A mother ought to be paid liberally in pure gold, but the good and godly mothers demonstrate wisdom beyond dollars and cents. Her reward is to see her children become believers in the Lord Jesus and to demonstrate God's wisdom, love, faith, and hope in a bankrupt world. Let's ask the singers to come forward now, and I just want to pray for our mothers right now as the singers are coming forward, okay? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we could spend looking at scriptures and the words, and, and really even we thank you for the day that we have honoring mothers, Father, and it's so, it ought to be so that we ought to honor mothers and our grandmothers, Lord. And Lord, pray that we would seek to let others know that a mother is the highest position that a woman could possibly have, Lord. And even as we sing now, and as, even as we bear testimony, Lord, may we have a, these points driven home to us this morning. For Christ's glory we pray it. Amen. Could you stand to your feet?